everybody. I hope um, that today what I share with you will bring some points in your life that you can look at yourself a little bit different and learn from, from my life and hopefully look at your life with different eyes. Um, I'm originally from Honduras, and uh, how many of you know where Honduras is? <laughs> Great. It seems funny, but sometimes um, when I introduce myself to Americans, usually, they think I'm from Mexico. Even though I say Honduras, they ask me again, and, and hey, in Mexico, how, how, what kind of food do you eat? Is it similar to ours? And I have to explain again, I'm not from Mexico. So I want today um, to give you a little bit of background about Honduras. What is it? And a little bit of it. Um, we, we, we like to think, Honduran, we like to think we are the heart of, of America. We are in the middle of North, Central, and South America. We, we are pretending that we are the heart of America, so we like to think that way. Um, as you can see in the map, you want to have a visual, more or less, where is it? There is United States, there is Mexico, and if you keep going, there is Guatemala, and after Guatemala, there is Honduras, and south to Honduras, El Salvador, and then we have Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, and then South America, okay? Honduras, the name of Honduras means great deep depths. And it's funny because um, the story is that when um, Christopher Columbus came for the first time, he had a really hard time trying to get to Honduras, and his ships almost sink. And then uh, when he touched land, he said, oh, well, well this is a great depth. And this is what they told me at school. <laughs> I'm not so sure, but that's what they say. That's why we are called Honduras. So anyway, uh, as you can see clearly here, we have um, a few islands in the north. We have the two um, um, oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic, and we border with Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala. Um, and that's important just for a few things I'm gonna say later on, so you can have more or less a picture of that. Um, things Honduras is famous for. There are many things, bad and good ones, but I'm just gonna share three of them, and just good ones. The first one, uh, the west, the east of Honduras, um, there are native people from there. There were the, the, the um, records that they were living there from 3,000 years ago. So we have people in Honduras that live even before Jesus came to this world. Uh, and that's the, that's the, I don't know, you see it? Yeah, the east that area where the map is, uh, is very, it's called, this is the second, this area of Honduras is the second after the Amazons. It's the second um, uh, green area of Latin America. It's treated as a treasure. So that's a nice thing to know. And uh, a lot of the areas haven't been really, uh, um, how do you say, colon colonized, or people from the city haven't even been there yet. So um, I have done a few trips, and uh, it's hard. Things you think are easy to deal with, like clothes and, and food and houses, is really tough when you go to visit those Indians and when you have to, your next meal will depend on how good you are hunting or fishing, is an experience. The next one, um, the margin. We're known for the, uh, the um, Mayan. I don't know if you know about the Mayan. There's a, um, in Mexico, we have the Aztecs, the, the native Indians. In the United States, we have what, uh, uh, Cherokee and many other tribes. In, 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 in Guatemala and um, west of Honduras, we have uh, uh, the Mayan. And um, they are very known for um, very high, sophisticated intellectual people. They were crazy, they killed a lot of people, and they offered to their gods uh, a lot, but at the same time, they developed a very sophisticated language. Um, according to people nowadays, the calendar Maya, the Mayan calendar is 
one of the most sophisticated calendar there is to this point. It's, it aligned even, I don't know if you remember that two, three years ago, they were saying about this prophecy about 2012 and the craziness of the Mayan and stuff. Well, Mayan didn't do, didn't do any prophecy, but what they said is that they, they align the calendar from month to years and planetary to the solar system and not only to our solar system, but to the tip of the galaxy. So at that date, supposedly, the galaxies from very far will align a series of, a series of planets in one line. And every time that happened, big events happen. And according to their own records, um, Noah's floods happen at that time. So yes, something happens, but something don't necessarily have to happen. But the calendar just announced that that's what it, what it was for. And one more thing. Yes, we have this beautiful island in the north that is considered like the second more amazing coral reef. People love to come and scuba dive uh, and have fun in Honduras. It's, it's really amazing. Uh, we have all craziness stuff. There are sharks. You have to be careful. And I'm going to give you a little bit of history. And if I can see the clock, can you move the clock somewhere? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to be here until 3. I, I'm assuming you will not want to do that too. I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of history between the 70s and the 90s. Yes, I'm that old. And that will help us to understand the context, the, the context in, what, in which I was brought up. Um, Honduras was a um, military um, government, governed for a very, very long time, very long time. And uh, from the 30s to the 70s are the ones that were more um, aggressive and not so nice. Um, that's one of the things. In the 80s, we all know about the Cold War. And what that did to Central America, even though the Cold War was more with Russia and all the craziness about, you know, the communists taking over the world and the United States being afraid of not letting that happen and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what that did to Central America is that Nicaragua with Somoza was trying to be, become a communist country. As, the, uh, as Cuba did. Um, so Nicaragua has support from Cuba and some of the Russians. So that got a little bit of panicking, and the United States made a military base in Honduras to protect and to have more or less sort of control over the craziness that was going on. Uh, at the same time, uh, things were happening in El Salvador with guerrilla, guerrillas and in Guatemala. So it was very violent, very... Um, um, not so free time for everybody. So um, that affected us in the, in the sense that um, the, the United States military sometimes was established and even walk in our streets with the uniform and with the guns and everything. And, and they were supposedly joined together with um, our military to trying to protect us. And I will not say more about that, but I will just say that um, there are a couple of articles if you're interested in knowing about that. And um, uh, let me see if I can see that. One is from the New York, New York Times, and um, this person talks about all the military craziness that happened in the 80s, especially in the 80s, how the military take advantage of their power and did really ugly things. And I'm just going to put those two articles, and you can have a chance and maybe look at it sometime. And you can ask me if you want to know more. But I think uh, for time's sake and purpose, we should move on. My parents. I'm going to talk about my parents because I think, um, you know, so as an adult, we always say our parents mess us up a lot. Would you say that? <laughs> but... It always helped me to understand the, con the, the context and how they were brought up to understand what they did with me. And that actually healed my heart in many ways in, in, in things that they did to me and the way I was brought up. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about them. That's my mom with me. I'm a th I think I'm six years old, six months, 
and on the other one, like a year and a half, and the other one is my dad. My mom had a really tragic, tragic life. She was abandoned when she was a kid, and she was left on the uh, uh, tra train track to be killed, and a couple of old ladies picked her up. They heard her cry, and they picked her up and, and brought it, and uh, then, um, you know, have a lot of issues my mom with um, acceptance, and, you know, because from her childhood, he had very, very tragic, tragic moments like that. Another one that I remember she telling me is that when she was five years old, her mom had like 12 kids, and she could not take care of her. And she left her abandoned in the market. And she put the other kids on the bus and moved. And my mom was following her, crying after the bus for my mom. And, and they left, and you know, she was left in the, in the market, and some people pick her up and um, help her to, to go. I don't know how she did it. That's really crazy. My dad, my dad, um, I love my dad very much. He's um, a man who um, loves sports, loves soccer. And um, when he was seven years old, his dad beat up his mom, and uh, uh, he sent her to the hospital after that beating up, and she died in the hospital. So my dad grew up with our mom for, since he was seven and, and up. And uh, it was hard for him. And uh, when I was born, my mom was 15 years old. And my dad was almost 17. Um, and, and the sadness of it is that my dad's dreams was always to be a professional soccer player. And then I came on the picture. And uh, it sort of uh, made him a little bit disappointed in many ways. And as you imagine, as a, as a teenager to have a kid, didn't know really how to do anything. And it was, it was tough for them. Um, so that's a little bit of the background with my parents. Uh, two things shaped my life, but before, before talking about them, I just want to say one thing that happened in my childhood before my 10 years, when I was, well, I had really think that I have a beautiful childhood, honestly. I was very nice. The first years, I remember, I, I remember my dad really being funny and my mom really being loving. And, uh, but when I was uh, going to kindergarten, something happened that I think affected me in my teens, the way I treat authority and the way I see men. And, and I was going to the kindergarten and um, I didn't want to stay. And that happened one day, and I went back with mom. And two days, and I went back, and three days, and five days. After a week, the school uh, told my parents, if I didn't stay the next day, they were going to give my place to somebody else. As you imagine, my dad and my mom were angry and didn't know how to deal with me. What my dad did, he beat me up really crazy. Beat me up so hard that I could not walk for a whole week. And I know he was so sorry after that. But I think that affected me deeply because um, the way I respond to men authority and the way I deal with those issues, I think were really, really based a lot of my defense mechanisms and my way of treating those things based on that beat up. I was really deeply hurt. But that was when I was kindergarten, I don't know, five, six years old. I can still remember that. In my teen years, there were two main things that happened that shaped my life, and one of them was soccer. Um, I'm coming from a really poor neighborhood. You know, Honduras is third world, third world country, and uh, I'm coming from a poor country, but I'm not only coming from a poor country. I'm, I'm coming from a poor neighborhood, and not only from a poor neighborhood. I'm coming from the poorest of the poorest within the neighborhood. So for us, we always had the label of, oh, there's, there's these guys, or, you know, like probably here you will see there are the rednecks coming up or something. I don't know. I was always dirty. I was always with no shoes or some kind of shoes. And, uh, but when I start playing soccer, something dynamically happened in my life that really helped me to cope with many things. And that was that because we were in the, the poorest of the poorest, we made a soccer team out of uh, the neighborhood. And that gave me... Um, 
I could see um, how that unified me with my other friends and made me really strong, uh, make a, a really strong uh, brotherhood. Uh, we used to go to other countries uh, within, um, you know, and play against them. And we can see that we can go sometimes to go and play against the rich guys, and we will beat them up, and we will be really so happy and calm. And so give me a sense of belonging, belonging to someone, belonging somewhere, and having been in a place where, you know, I guess you would say I was, I was going to be okay. I had my bodies that were with me. And um, so the next thing that happened was music. I started going to the conservatory and st study music. And what music did, did for me uh, is open up many, many, many possibilities that I didn't know I could do or, or have. And uh, I started studying seriously and going to things that I didn't understand and I, I didn't... Um, know that will affect me, like violin, piano, um, composition. Composition one, one was one of the things that really put me into a, uh, a serious mindset to experiment and to elaborate things and seeing them flourish and coming up to life. It did affect me. And also, I played in for some folk bands. You could say folk bands, but actually they were protest music in the 80s. Um, there was a group of poets and writers and played, um, um, I, I don't know how you say it, played rights, I guess, and um, actors from the university. They somehow, I don't know how, I was a teenager, I was not, not even 15, 16, and I just got related to them. And when they saw me playing the instrument, uh, it's like we interchanged. I made some bands, I wrote some songs against the government and the stuff, the crazy stuff that was going on. They loved it, and they gave me this visual and intellectual way of looking at life that uh, I will not see any other place. I first came, out, came, came in touch with um, writers of Marx, um, um, some poets from the South, Ruben Darío from Nicaragua, uh, Sosa in Honduras, that talk about deep things of life that sometimes we just miss. So music made me have this sense of, yes, my people need me. I can do this for them. I can write this song about what is going on. And when people listen to it and they were singing what the stuff I was writing and, and we will go to you know, countries and small places where to sing it and play it. And, and I will see the reaction of people and saying, yes, yes, that's what, that's what we need. That kind of gave me a unification in, in me that I could see the music have a purpose in my life. And uh, so it did really shape my, my life I mean, deeply. Now, when I was 17, something happened in my neighborhood. There was a lady who came to, to found a church. Now, you have to understand, coming to our neighborhood, being a guy means that you are brave. Being a lady, was something super unusual. And then this, this lady preaching on the street, talking to people, renting a small little thing that wasn't really a place, and having church services there. And so I, I, I was very interested to get to know this lady and start to be friends with her. And she invited me once to a, um, um, an American um, crusade. I went to it, and uh, I listened to the message. And honestly, the message was really boring. Didn't care for it at all. And uh, the person who talked to me, there was a lady who asked me, do you want to come and receive Jesus? I mean, that was just so cheap way of talking in comparison to my friends, poets, and, and my writers, and, and you know, all this stuff, crazy stuff we had done that it was just not really interesting. But when she said that, Something happened in my, in my atmosphere, atmosphere. It wasn't what she said. It wasn't the sermon. It was just something that I could not explain it. And I just nodded to her. And at the moment I nodded, I just 
start crying like crazy, like, like unbelievably, like crying. And I was so embarrassed because the lady with my friends were in, my, in the back. These people were here, and people were kind of surprised that I was crying like that intense. And I was overtaken. I, I could not explain it. It was just an amazing feeling that I never, never heard before and never felt before. So that was my first encounter uh, with God and his presence. Um, the second one I have that I think was one of the very, very deep in, in my heart was two years after. A friend of mine invited, us, invited me to, sit to a, a worship conference uh, in El Salvador, which is the next country. At this point, we don't have, I don't have enough money to, to finance my, my trip. And one of the con- members of our congregation said, hey, I have 200 lempiras. Uh, that's all I have, but I feel that God is telling you to go. I, as I could, I added 200 more, and that was enough for three days. And the conference was five days. So I said, well, I feel that God says I should go. And then we went with my friend. And just as the moment I, I first encountered God, the moment the guy started playing the keyboards in that conference, it happened again. It's like, it wasn't them. It wasn't what the preacher was saying. It wasn't what they were singing. It was just absolutely terrifying a little bit, but at the same time, peaceful and loving atmosphere. And I remember crying like crazy first time, first day, second day. Third day, man, I could not believe it. I was worse than a girl. I was just crying and crying and crying all the time. I mean, it was just an amazing experience. Not only his presence was there, but the thing that shaped me is that I started understanding things about God that wasn't just so theological or intellectual. And and the things started to happen right after it. When When the third day came and the money, we ran out of the money with my friend, People who, that we didn't know always invited us to eat. I said, hey, you know, you want to come and hang out with us? Let's, let's go and eat. And I would just look to my friend and say, well, yeah, sure. And people, this is people that you have to understand. These people that I've never seen before. And I could see lunch. I could see it at dinner. I could see it at breakfast. Every moment, every moment of the day, somebody was doing that. And so that even made me cry even more, because I was like, eh, I cannot believe it. This is crazy. But the last day of the conference, we had to come back. We were saying goodbye to everybody that are already closing the, the, the church. And we're at the door, and we don't have money to come back. We don't have one penny, and we don't know anybody there. And I tell my friend, well, we should just walk to the bus station and see what happened. And we start walking to the bus station. And when we're about to get there, somebody like from five blocks starts shouting my name and, and waving. And you have to understand, this is weird because first, my name is not that common, even in my country. And for me to hear it in El Salvador was like really weird. And I wasn't really sure it was me. But that person was really waving and waving. And, and as, as she comes closer, she said, oh, do you don't remember me. We played together in the Youth Symphony in Costa Rica many years ago. And, and honestly, I didn't remember her that well. And she started saying, oh, man, I cannot believe you're here in my country, and you never called me. I should have gone and, gone and show you everywhere in my family. And she got from happy to mad that I didn't call her, and that she was wanted to show me everything. She wanted to take me to the symphony and all that crazy. And then after that, she got like, you know what? At least what I can do, she said, is to pay you your ticket back. I'm going to go and get some food. And uh, give me a second. So she, she went to, she bought a food. She gave us some presents. She bought the ticket for us. And only that, she gave, us, she gave us extra money. I don't know where that came from. But when we were in the bus with my friend,
That's some water. Um, when I was in the bus with my friend, I could not believe um, God will be more real to us. And uh, as I went by, when I came back, there were so many times where I remember going from my house that I didn't have money even for the bus to go to the church. And I would just laugh and say, I know you're going to do it again. It was funny because sometimes we were pass by. I would just be walking to the church, and somebody would stop in the car and say, hey, where are you going? You need a ride? And they would take me to the, oh, thank you. They would take me to the church, and then once at church, I would just be in, into all this stuff, and I would forget that I need money to, for, com, for coming back home. And sometimes I remember I would just be packing my instruments, and somebody would just come and say, hey, you know, put it in my pocket and say, hey, God is telling me to give you this. And I would just smile. <laughs> and um, I'm sorry, it's, it's a little bit too... <laughs> I haven't talked about these things for a long time, and uh, it's coming back and a little bit strong. But every time that happened, it always changed my heart and always made me understand God in a deeper way than more just theologically. And um, I know I have to move on, and uh, let me tell you a few things. Um, when I was at church, one of the main obstacles, believe it or not, to grow for me in faith was the church itself. Because the church was really a good factory of rules, it was a good factory of templates that I was supposed to follow, but many times it wasn't a, a place where I could meet God. It wasn't a place. And I had so many questions. Understanding poetry of, of, of some of my friends from before and understanding the craziness that I had seen in my country in the 80s, all the stuff I had witnessed, I still had questions for God. I know he was real, and I never doubted he was real. But uh, the church made, made it seem that I had to comply to so many systems in so many ways. And music was, was one of them. I could not play classical music, some of them say, because it's not from God. Or oh, music, that, that's not Christian music, or crazy stuff like that. Art is not, you know, spiritual enough. It's not churchy. And that's some of the things that happened. So, um, music. Um, even though they were saying those things, I know they were saying it out of their own love to God. That's what they knew about him. And I never judged them for that, but I, I understood that if God is, is God, should be smarter than me, don't you think? And should be smarter than a lot of poets. And all those thoughts that are sophisticated, God should be above all of them. And I wanted some answers. And I didn't see them at church. Uh, and um, let me see if I can speed up here. Uh, I have questions about the cosmos, nature, um, the Indians. And I didn't find it at church. And something shaped me really hard. One well, of my friends from childhood, we used to play soccer all the time. He, he hanged himself with his own belt. And I found him. And when I found him, uh, I wasn't resentful to God. But, but I was like, you're not a wimpy God. You have to have an explanation for this. I, I mean, we are screwed up as humans. And we need answers. And yes, I understand your, your God, but we are here. And my questions were making a big distance from me to the church. And uh, that's when I start going into a different journey. And my journey was music. And I'm gonna speed it up because I have just five more minutes or seven. I'm gonna go quickly. So. I thought the music was not, the depth of music was not really Christiani or redempted. 
So, but that's what I was gifted at. So um, one lady decided to help me to come to the United States and st study composition and music and violin. And I started getting more into the journey of music and st I st got really deep into music, composition, left the church. <clears throat> but I always was saying to God, I I'm leaving the church because it's, it seemed really, the template is not good for me. I need something else. I need you to reveal it to me. And so that was my journey. But something happened with that that changed it. And I always ask God, you, 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 are, you are wise, but the, the, the answer that people give me at church are really sometimes not that smart. And uh, the way I, go, I went back to God and my journey back to him was through music. The, thought, the thing that I thought it was going to take me away from him, he started using it to bring me back and to reveal himself in a, in a deeper way that I could not believe it. I mean, I could not believe it. As you, I'm going to share a few things. I'm going to share two things about that, that with you. That um, I started seeing things from the really hard to understand things and the very easy to understand things. Those two things got together in music that shaped me really, really, really amazingly. And, and this is the way it happened. Let me see if I can. The Trinity. The Trinity is something that we understand, sometimes Christians understand pretty well because they taught us at church and we can see it in the text. But we don't really bother to really explore that, what really it is, and understand it deeply. And that was one of my journeys. How did that work? That doesn't make any sense. I can understand it here, but really, how does it work? And I was going in this journey, and one day I remember God talking to me about it. And the thing started with music. What are the three elements of music? Melody, harmony, and rhythm. And I start feeling his presence and, and, and his direction telling me, it is there. Can you see it? And I, I start opening my eyes about it and, and seeing it. And understanding, for example, music, these three elements, without each other, they cannot work. For example, melody, even if it doesn't have any harmony or rhythm, in every note have a, what we call a harmonic series. So every note in itself have a set of sounds that you may not hear, but they are there. So from one note to the next note, there are already harmonies, even if you don't hear them. You may be, hear, you may be able to hear them if you train yourself, but if you, even if you don't hear them, the harmony is there. And I was like, yeah, that, that makes sense. And then rhythm. When you do a, a note, it's already having a rhythm. You cannot have a note without having a rhythm. So the note cannot exist by itself. When you do a hit, there is a note there. And that hit, that note will produce a harmony. And he was telling me, do you see it? We're always there. One cannot exist without the other one. The rhythm is gonna, always going to be there. The harmony is always going to be there. And the melody is always going to be there. And I start, of course, he started blowing, up, blowing away my mind. And I was like, that's crazy. You're amazing. This is, this is just simple. Because music, who doesn't enjoy music in this planet? Even the animals. Have you seen some of funny videos? The animals dancing. Even the animals enjoy that. And he revealed himself through it. So simple. Not only that, but uh, the other thing that is, is not easy to swallow for us is pain. If you ever have going through pain, if you ever have seen somebody die in your family, or somebody, somebody kill themselves, or if abuse, or whatever it is, if you ever have had pain, you always have that question, why? Why me? Why us? Why couldn't? If he saw God, why couldn't he make one without that? 
because we are the one taking it. But one day he showed me to also, he responded very nicely. And, and I'm gonna try to do it with the, with the keyboard if you allow me. Let me see if I can, I have two more minutes. Um, one, two, can you hear me? So um, all my pain and all my questions about it went away when I started studying music and he showed me there is always, for a piece to be a masterpiece, there's always have to be tension so that the release will be great. Listen to this. It can be like that, but it's less. Or it can be like this, really crazy, but there is the release. And I was, okay, yeah, I understand that. And he just showed me that your life and my life, for it to be a piece, it has to go through all this tension. And even though we may not like it or understand it while we go through, at the end of the day, the masterwork will be marvelous. And God himself, one day, will make all tension be full of relief. And not only that, but we will say, that is just glorious. That is just glorious. And this piece is an example of this. Um, I'm going to try to play it. I haven't played it in a long time. But it shows, for example, here, life goes OK, but then we get pain, and then some relief and I'm more pain and even though sometimes even more painful he's always going to be there and you know what everybody's life have, is a representation of a piece of music. And don't let the music die with you. Make it up, marvelous artwork. And when it's really tough, just understand that the master is doing something in your heart that's gonna be glorious. And he showed me that through music, which is amazing, so simple, so general for everybody to understand. And if, if I may conclude today, I want you to understand, even though there are many things that I have singing in music, like texture, timbre, form, and all that kind of stuff, these two things I will, I will say, take it with you. God is always going to be there. Maybe in rhythm, maybe in harmony, maybe in the melody you're singing. But he's always going to be there. And if there is tension, just understand that the release is coming, and it's going to be great. Um, thank you for listening to me, and would you stand with me and, and just pray before we finish?